Okay, welcome. I think we'll uh, make a start. I think there's a number of people joined the call already, and um, I'm sure more will be uh, joining in now. So, uh, hello, uh, my name is Paul Burstow. I'm the chair of the Social Care Institute for Excellence, um, and uh, this is the third of a series of webinars that Sky have been running since the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic and the lockdown. Uh, and they really are very much a response to requests and feedback that we've had from people uh, on the Sky website and uh, through other communications over the last few weeks. Um, we, our last session was focusing on the CARE Act uh, and the one before that was responding to a number of the questions that were emerging immediately after the Prime Minister announced the lockdown. Um, what I think we uh, now are trying to respond to are uh, a number of concerns about uh, the, uh, the social care sector in particular in terms of home of care homes um, and I think one of the things I, I, I reflect is some comments over the last couple of days as we're beginning to see the numbers uh, of deaths in hospital going down uh, we're beginning to see the numbers of people being admitted to hospital uh, with uh, the symptoms of uh, COVID um, in truth what we're also seeing but maybe not so visibly stated is a change in where the battlefield is, where the front line is. Uh, I know only too well just how much uh, care homes have been in uh, the front line for weeks now in responding to COVID. But I think it's becoming even more clear that uh, social care generally uh, and care homes in particular are now even more so in that front line of uh, addressing the issues and problems uh, of uh, responding to COVID. So what we have today is really pleased uh, to be joined by the incoming Chief Executive of uh, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, Catherine Smith, uh, and I'll be uh, introducing her again in a, a little while uh, and hopefully see her on the camera there. And I'm also really pleased that we have a colleague from uh, the front line here, uh, Sarah Mitchell, who is the, uh, the manager of Bridge House Care Home in West Yorkshire. And in a moment, I'm going to ask her to uh, give us uh, her perspective on uh, managing on the front line when it comes to uh, uh, the challenges around COVID at the moment. Um, just put these uh, this slide up. It just uh, contains uh, uh, some of the headlines that we're seeing at the moment. Um, the very sobering headline about the, uh, the numbers of deaths uh, that have occurred in care homes and in I think in the community more generally as well. Uh, figures that it took far too long to uh, properly publish and, and uh, reflect on um, and uh, which need to be recognised uh, as well. Um, and secondly, I think just a sort of recognition that uh, older people in particular, but I would say also people with learning disabilities as well, have been the uh, perhaps unseen uh, victims of uh, COVID. Uh, and uh, have maybe experienced real, real, real disadvantages as a result of uh, the way in which um, uh, the outbreak has uh, gone so far. Um, I, I think worth saying that one of the things that uh, Sky has done over the last uh, few weeks is act as a bit of a hub through our website of all of the materials that are available to support people in the social care sector uh, and uh, those with uh, social care needs to. Uh, uh, understand and navigate their way through all the guidance and other materials that are now available. Uh, and uh, recently we, uh, we sort of had on our website materials published by Public Health England uh, around, I think, guidance, particularly around PPE. Something I'll be very interested to get Sarah's uh, view on in a moment. Um, and we've also published guidance, uh, had guidance published around uh, uh, supported living provision as well. Um, and when we consider there are over 200,000, I think, people in the country who are uh, living in some form of supported living it is a significant part of our population. Um, I think before I hand over to Sarah, I just wanted to uh, say that Sky is playing its part in supporting uh, the Department uh, of Health and Social Care in delivering the action plan that was published uh, last week uh, on the 15th of April. Uh, that action plan includes uh, commitments by Sky to work with local authorities and others to support them in the immediate uh, issues around managing COVID uh, and in thinking about commissioning of uh, services going forward. Uh, and there's more details on the uh, Social Care Institute for Excellence's website. So that's my first sort of few opening words. I see there's a number of uh, 
comments in the uh, questions box already. Um, please do use that as your channel for uh, asking questions. Uh, if we don't have an answer today, and I'm sure we'll have many of the answers thanks to Catherine and Sarah, um, then we will uh, want to uh, make sure we provide information later. So I'm really pleased that we're being joined by Sarah Mitchell today, um, and she's going to talk us through uh, the, her perspective as a manager uh, of a care home in West Yorkshire. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. So I'm going to read from my notes, um, and I've just jotted a few areas down which I thought was important to share with you our, our finding it. So I've been a home manager for about the last 17 years um, in various homes. I'm currently managing a large nursing and dementia home. Um, when asked the question of what it's like managing a home during COVID, I think it's been difficult to answer that because us as home managers, we are usually resilient to change and to problem solving and just somehow just get on with it and manage what's put in front of us. However, I would say that the, there is the fear of the unknown and we're all doing our best um, day to day, making decisions based on what our gut feelings are and balancing that with the guidance and the research that's put in front of us. Um, I think as well, if you put COVID to one side, we still need to make sure that we're managing a safe and a high quality service. Um, so the job's hard enough as it is without obviously um, the COVID pandemic at present. Um, I do feel that for us, the care home sector wasn't a primary focus at the start of the pandemic. However, the campaign led by the key organisations such as um, Alzheimer's and CQC um, did bring a massive response and a major key turning point for us as social care providers. Um, the biggest impact I feel that um, we've seen at, at, at this site was the testing that was introduced for staff. Um, I personally have used the CQC link um, that was sent to all providers as I found this the most effective and the most efficient way. Uh, to give you an example, for any symptomatic resident, uh, sorry, staff that we had, uh, they had a test date within 24 hours. Um, the, test, um, the test results were back um, as soon as 24 to 36 hours following that test. Um, I would say I've seen a dip in that now since the self-referral has come out, uh, where they're experiencing some barriers and there's a delay in getting the testing uh, for our staff members. So hopefully that's just a blip and, you know, the, the, the um, IT and the testing centres will, will match the demand for that service now. Um, I think the testing of residents hasn't been effective, in my opinion, um, unless they've been sent to hospital, um, where the testing results at hospital is 6 to 18 hours. Um, we've, we've tested our residents here that are symptomatic through the Health Protection ILOG system. Um, there was a delay in re receiving these stocks due to them running out. Um, the, there were some residents that, therefore, when the tests were received, that had gone past the fifth day uh, of symptomatic and being isolated. Um, the test results on residents that were taken have still not been received to date. However, we are going to be quite interested to see and compare the results of those, sadly, those residents that were taken into hospital who have had a test here, but also in hospital because their their tests in hospital have, have, have come back positive. So we will be quite in, in, you know um, interested to see what what our results came back if it, it is the same outcome. Um, we have, however, today when I when I logged on this morning, we've received a further CQC link for resident testing. So I've actually actioned that this morning. Um, so it will be good to see how the effectiveness of that that link um, takes for resident testing. Um, we do understand that there's a lot of anxieties of people and, uh, you know, at, at presently, and we all have different coping mechanisms. So we're trying as an organisation to be as supportive as possible. We're using the social media platforms more effectively as our communication tools, whether that be Skype calls, daily up, uh, email updates to our, to our um, res uh, relatives and our Facebook page to keep those involved in the home as updated as, you know, as much as possible. We're trying to educate the staff much as possible. For example, when the more recent PPE guidance was, was sent out, we, we downloaded this immediately to our uh, care devices. So it was on hand to the staff team immediately. Um, and we've also commissioned our staff to undertake the COVID-19 e-learning training to, to provide them as much evidence and much research and information as possible to do the task in hand. And obviously we've got our HR support service, which has supported staff with more significant issues in relation to them shielding from work. Um, so I think going back to the testing of staff, um, if I give an example, which, which again is worrying for us on the front line, um, one staff, we started, we introduced um, staff, taking staff temperatures um, at the home. And one, one in particular was quite an eye opener for us where we took a staff member's 
temperature was, was above the threshold, the staff member felt absolutely fine to work. They did get isolated. And to this date, that staff member has still had no symptoms, but their test results came back positive. Um, so for us, it's, it, you know, it causes ex, uh, you know, more an anxiety and worry of how much, how many of us are actually presenting this way and continue to work within, within, our, you know, within, within our daily work. Um, on a positive, I feel that uh, the local authority that I work with, Calderdale and their infection control team, they've been really extremely supportive. Um, and I feel do feel quite organized. Um, they have appointed a key person for the home who phones us or emails us daily. And where we've seen our PP stock level, PP stock levels challenge, they've arranged this provision um, effectively. So we're fortunate this home where we've not run out of any stock levels. We've come low, but we, we've used the correct channels and you know, we've, we've shouted up and demanded that we, we need that, that, that PPE within the home. Um, but our usual suppliers, their, their stock levels are, are, are a barrier. So we are having to use alternative um, networks there to get that. The creativity and entrepreneurism of individuals and businesses, I think, has been fabulous. Um, we've seen this first hand by having a local rest restaurant delivering fresh food for our cook, me um, cook meals for our staff on duty. And we've had local businesses provide face masks and we've had an individual that's made visors, which we see across the, the news every day with these good news stories. Um, so I think that's really, really important. And it does keep us all going. Um, after COVID, because um, I think we do need to think about the next six months, 12 months ahead. I do believe that ways of working will change and will become smarter in some aspects, possibly around IT, uh, often which isn't used to its full potential, and I'm certainly guilty of that. Um, we, we're seeing more online support from GPs, continuing healthcare reviews, assessments, and I feel we should all now prepare for the next six months ahead as COVID-19 has and will continue to change the way we work to ensure we function effectively and efficiently in any future crisis. So, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I think that's, uh, there's a lot there and a lot to, uh, to discuss in, in, in this uh, webinar. I'm gonna ask one question now, then I'm gonna to come to Catherine, if I may. And that was really um, to sort of get a little bit more from you about um, what the current arrangements are to support staff, um, both obviously in terms of their physical protection in terms of PPE, which you've been talking about, but also uh, thinking more long term, the sort of uh, the stresses of being on a front line uh, with the uncertainties you you talked about, sort of uh, fear in a way that uh, you don't know whether you've got the condition. What 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 sort of things are, uh, are already being done to try and make sure we're we're sort of looking after the the psychological, I guess, welfare and safety of of, of staff. So again, it's, it's, it's communicating and listening to your staff team. Um, you know, we do that on a daily basis. It is important to hear what their fears are, because like I say, we all respond to things in a different way. Um, so we, 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 have, we have WhatsApp groups. We, we, we ask the staff for their feedback. Uh, and like I say, there are, we don't, we're not pushing staff at this moment in time. There are some staff that have remained off work and the reason they're off work is because of anxiety, not that they've had a shielding letter or that they're symptomatic, just purely because they are they are anxious and, and we then have got the luxury of a, a HR function and that they're supporting them through there um, and actioning any support, whether it's counselling or, you know, any, any help further that they do need. But it is that it's that listening ear um, with regards to the PPE. And I suppose going back to that last one, it is giving them as much information as, as we can of the reasons why we're doing things and why they have to wear the PPE. It's, it's, I don't think it's any use saying there, there's some gloves, there's aprons, there's a face mask, pop them on for me and, and do your job. It's why do you need to do it? And once they've got that education, which has been the e-learning module, uh, you know, as cells going around and educating the staff, the PPE guidance that immediately was sent out, I think it came out about 11 o'clock at night. We managed to pick that up straight away and really, you know, get that out to the staff team. Um, I just think education, I mean, we are, a lot of us are blind and working blind um, and we're taking any research as, as, you know, valued and we're acting on it. Um, but with anything, it's, it's really just to support the staff and just make sure they, they understand why we're doing things. Um, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a new thing for everybody. It's just that going back to managing a home, it's listening to your staff team and giving them as much, much support as you can in any area that they're, they're struggling with. Thank you, thank you very much. And just on that point about research, um, we, uh, I think, are publishing on our COVID hub on our website, uh, any of the most recently published research, and obviously new research is coming out all the time now 
uh, which I think can be again helpful to, to people at the front line in terms of adjusting practice uh, on the basis of that. So now I'm going to come to uh, Catherine. Welcome, Catherine, to, uh, to the Social Care Institute, and uh, I'm going to press uh, move on to the next slide for you, uh, so that you can. Uh, uh, there we go. Sorry, sorry for the pause there. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. So. Yeah, I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer at Alzheimer's Society, where I've been um, for almost eight years, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of months, particularly looking at the response to COVID and how it relates to the care sector, and particularly care homes. So um, I'm leaving Alzheimer's Society on Thursday, and I'm starting with Sky on Monday. But... Um, Obviously, uh, a lot of what um, I've been doing with Alzheimer's Society is directly relatable to what Sky will do, particularly around the, um, the COVID uh, situation. So, um, Paul, would you mind moving it on a slide, please? Yes, of course. There we go. Thank you. So, um, I'm going to talk to you through what people have been telling us in care homes, and it's actually really good hearing from Sarah because we can see that some of the, the campaigning that has come from ourselves and from other organisations is beginning to have an effect because, um, as Sarah mentioned, um, care homes were forgotten, we feel, at the beginning of this journey. Uh, it's interesting that we've heard that, um, uh, that this had been flagged as an issue by some scientists early on, but it certainly didn't come out in the practice or in the guidance. And um, we heard from many, many care homes that they were feeling that they were sort of left to their own devices. And this is also true of home care as well, that care home and home care staff were um, having to manage this on their own, didn't have great guidance, didn't have support, couldn't get personal protective equipment or the knowledge and information on how to use it and weren't getting any testing. So people were feeling um, really quite concerned. Staffing has been really quite stretched, as particularly as people have been advised to self-isolate. Um, then people, even if they just had as much as a little cough, felt that they needed to stay at home. And so that was having quite an impact on the staffing levels for care homes and home care. And we've also been told about people that might use personal assistance as well. And personal assistance not being um, classed as key workers, a lot, a lot of personal assistance just, we can't come to work. And so people that were using direct payments or, or whatever for their care were, were finding a gap there. So. The, the first issue for us, the first priority area, was about how we campaigned for safety and support within care homes. And that was particularly around the urgent need for testing of both people within the care home, the residents of the care home, but also of the staff that are working within the care home. And that needs to be regular, needs to be sustained, and that's not happened yet. Um, it's getting better, and uh, really good to hear from Sarah that it sounds like it's moving on by the minute which which is really good um but mobile testing units have been set up and we understand that for some people there's a 60 mile drive to those mobile testing units if they can't get there more um if there isn't one close to them so that's quite a an issue i'm going back on myself sorry um the other issue was that um, people were going, were being sent to a hospital, tested, and then sent back to the care home. And so the, the virus was effectively being sent back to the care home, where, where clearly it's a, a big risk. And I'm sure most of you in the audience are providers. I'm sure I'm not talking rocket science to you here, but it's not like barrier nursing in a ward, trying to barrier nurse in a care home, and particularly a care home where you've got people that have dementia or other um, cognitive impairments. So, so that was one of the major issues for us was about testing and we're still campaigning for that. The other was about um, the appropriate personal protective equipment and we had a lot of stories about care homes just quite simply not being able to access that. We had some people coming back to us saying that, um, well, care homes are profitable businesses, why aren't they paying for it themselves? It's really not quite as simple as that, as I'm sure you all know, in that even if you did have the extra budget to pay for the PP equipment, people weren't able to buy it. So care homes were having to rely on donations from local hairdressers or from um, um, 
schools or whatever else they had people making equipment for them which is all great and shows some fantastic community spirit but does mean that it's not the appropriate personal protective equipment that's required to do the job and again the training to do that job in the in the quantity required and then i think care homes had to make the decision to isolate before the government guidance came out telling them to do that the care homes had to be a bit ahead of the curve there and so some care homes made individual decisions to reduce visitors uh, or stop visitors to the care home to try to manage the, the spread of the disease um, and obviously that's continued with the government guidance and that has led to issues of even further isolation again both in people's own homes but also in care homes and we've had people speaking to us about how some of the interaction with the people with dementia is what keeps them going and keeps them being able to use their skills and being able to speak and reducing that in um, that isolation is really crucial and so we had some um we also asked the government to look at making um web-based solutions available more to care homes so lots of care homes and i know sarah's was a, a good example of this we're using things like FaceTime or, or whatever else to keep communicating and um, other care homes didn't have the equipment to do that so how could we do that the second area was of course when the government's emergency changes to the care act that lifted up the um uh, brought in the easements to the care act that of course um brought with it some great concerns for us so whilst we recognize that those measures contained within the act were temporary and should only be used in exceptional circumstances we also are very concerned that even before the um, pandemic social care was already facing significant challenges in its ability to support people affected by dementia with other conditions to live well and funding was already a big issue and some of those proposals included things such as speeding up hospital discharges um, and so that leads with it a real concern that people are discharged from hospital without the appropriate care and support and without the appropriate assessment um, and then when you come to um, the kind of care that people receive if people are receiving poor care whether that be in the home or in a care home it does leave people more vulnerable to things like falls infections dehydration and again that would lead to further pressure on on a and e so what we um, wanted to be really clear on is that within the emergency changes to the care act that there was some real accountability for how that how that was managed how it was published and that the elected members within each um, local authority area was accountable for that and that that the um any decision to lift that was very clear and transparent and that hasn't been the case across the board so that is still an area that we're still campaigning and we're still seeking changes um i've already mentioned about families having access to their um, loved ones in terms of reducing social isolation but another issue that was brought to us um a lot was about how um people can see the, their loved one before they die and some care homes were being very um concerned about letting people in and so there was no access at all others were being less so and again the guidance was very very tricky around that and gradually um care homes are, are coming up with their own solutions but what we're looking for was for the government to give very clear guidance to make sure that care homes understood and could give access to um people in their final days we felt it was quite inhumane for somebody to not have um a family member with them in their last few days um and so again that started to move on but the guidance is still not entirely clear there and is still very much reliant on individual care homes making decisions there we had some really alarming stories about people's rights being affected by virtue purely of their dementia or their learning disability or the area that they lived in um, and we had lots of stories of um local areas being sent out blanket do not resuscitate orders and care home staff being asked to encourage their people to sign them um, we also heard lots of stories of hospitals refusing to take admissions from care homes um, and things like that so again one of the areas we really wanted to campaign on well and we wanted to move that on was about people's rights not being affected during this time and people have um people's decision on a do not resuscitate order is a very very personal decision to be made at a fully informed moment and not as because people are feeling guilty or under pressure or that they have no choice and then finally the the last area there was about um people being able to access some very basic um things such as supermarkets so 
the, the shielded list came out, one and a half sh a million people on that shielded list, and that didn't include people with dementia. It didn't include people who had a disability or um, learning difficulty. And, and we, didn't, we don't actually think it should. We don't think people should be restricted so much, again, just by virtue of the condition. And that shielded list did bring in some real restrictions. And I think exists more for people that do have chronic health conditions that put them at real risk uh, of coronavirus. But because they weren't on the shielded list and there wasn't a, another category, that meant that people uh, with dementia and their carers weren't able to get priority access to supermarkets to buy their food and to things like that and to the online shopping slots. Um, we saw lots of stories of some very, very tearful carers who had tried to do the shopping for their um, the person that they were looking after and not able to get the shopping. They were working so quickly trying to, to move that along. So that was a real area for us. And again, we've um, done lots of campaigning, as have other organisations, to have social care workers and people receiving social care recognised as key workers and recognised as a priority. Um, that, that seems to have been more an individual response. So individual supermarkets have responded to that rather than the government coming out with any uh, guidance on that. But that, again, appears to be improving. And I think finally, what I'd say from an Alzheimer's Society perspective is that we've recognised from the beginning that this is unprecedented time. This is a pandemic. You know, nobody's going to have all of the answers to this up front. Um, and we are learning as we go along. But I think one of the key issues for us and the key things that we want to move on and that I want to move forward on when I move to Sky is about the fact that part of the reason why this has things like care homes were an afterthought is because social care has been an afterthought. And we need to lift up the, um, the, the relevance of social, work, social care in the minds of the policy makers and everybody else that social care is always a, a key issue for everybody not just when you need it um, it's, it needs to be there in the background working well so i think i've been asked now if i can cover the cqc slide which is next <laughs> so we were hoping that we'd have somebody from cqc join us today but unfortunately they weren't able to make it so instead they sent me sent us some notes. So I have the notes um, and there's a slide here that I will just talk through. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to answer CQC's questions for anybody, but I, I can go through their notes. So what CQ has said, CQC have said to us is that whilst they recognise that um, they need to continue to be alert and adapt to the changing environment, their core purpose remains the same, which is to keep people safe. And as a regulator, they want to continue to ensure that health and social care services provide people with safe, effective, compassionate and high quality care. So they've written out to all registered health and social care providers about how they're adapting their regulatory approach in response to the coronavirus outbreak. And those changes include things like stopping routine inspections, um, taking a shift towards other remote methods to give assurance of safety and quality of care in different ways. Um, there is some inspection activity in a small number of cases, and that is cases where, for example, there might be allegations of abuse. And then looking at how they can give extra support to registered managers within adult social care. Um, so during the period from the 10th of April to the 25th of April, they've made drive-through tests available to all of adult social care staff, GPs, and latterly the police, Ofsted, pharmacies, and other government agencies where no other testing option was available. They've sent invitation emails to over 32,000 provider locations and organisations and booked next day tests for um, nearly 33,000 staff, which I think must be the email that um, Sarah was referring to having received. So that's obviously getting, getting through, in, at least in some cases. They're now redirecting existing textbooking services to the government testing portal. Um, they've given us a, a website, which you can see there um, on the slide, which is any queries for people to um, direct them to that website. They are facilitating a pilot to see whether nursing homes where residents are symptomatic could be provided with a testing kit to carry out on-site testing for care home residents. And they are providing technology, information and resource to assist in the trialling of testing kits being sent to care homes for testing of residents. 
And they say that their role in this trial is to respond um, to requests from care homes for testing kits and to liaise with third parties to enable the kit to be couriered to the care home. They're also designing and launching a regular data collection on COVID-19 related pressures in home care. And they've issued a joint statement with the British Medical Association, the Care Provider Alliance and the Royal College of General Practice to make very clear that the do not attempt resuscitate decisions must continue to be made on an individual basis according to need. I'm personally very pleased to see that one. Um, and they're working with the Office of National Statistics to explore how to provide a more detailed and timely picture of the impact of COVID-19 on adult social care. And just on that last point, I, I just one final point that I'll make on this, and this comes about from my um, experience within our science society, but also my personal experience, is that one of the other key issues that we have been um, campaigning on is about how deaths related to coronavirus are recorded and deaths in care homes and in the community have not been recorded and reported along with the other deaths. The deaths that we've been hearing on the daily briefing, as you will know, has been about the ones in hospitals. So gradually those numbers are catching up with the ONS uh, uh, delivering those numbers, but we're about two weeks out of date, which means that um, decisions are being made and not being made on the true picture. And so we feel it's really important that, that um, those figures are reported and acted on more quickly. But the other issue for me is even those figures that are being reported now through ONS are still not giving the full picture because where care home residents are being tested, uh, are dying or even people in the community are dying if they haven't been tested COVID's not going on the death certificate which means that we the numbers that are affected we don't actually know the true picture so I personally was affected by this at the weekend my great aunt died in a care home um, where they know they had COVID and where she was starting to display symptoms of COVID and she died in the early hours of Saturday morning and her death certificate says dementia um, and I know that she's not the only one. And so for me, there is still an issue that even where um, deaths in care homes are being reported more, we're still not getting full picture. So I think providers can really help with that by speaking to relatives or, or GPs, whoever's signing the death certificate to talk to them about what is going on the death certificate and how that, that decision is being made. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine. That's um, really very helpful indeed. And uh, thank you, Sarah, as well. I think we've got a lot um, of useful insights and uh, uh, ideas coming out from that and also quite a lot of uh, questions on the uh, question line uh, that we've had so far. So I'm just going to, I think, fire some of those questions off, if I may, and just uh, sort of move us on to, uh, to that. Um, so I think this is probably this is a question from Natasha, which I'm going to start I think with Sarah, but I then come to you, Catherine, to to add uh, from your point of view. Um, how how are you keeping residents connected um, during this lockdown? Um, what we we do what we've mentioned in my in my um, in my briefing, it was you know we're doing Skype calls um, to families um, connected to the the COVID outbreak, we, we, we share with them the daily update as well for those that, that those are in, you know, understanding the current situation. So again, as much information that we can share, it's about being open and transparent with everybody, it's affecting us all. Um, and that is something that we're doing, but to, to keep to keep connected with their families, it is mainly on with the, the, the Skype calls and FaceTime calls. Um, and again, on our Facebook page of, you know, seeing what activities that they're doing and, you know, and giving little messages to their families and their loved ones. Um, but yeah, just remaining open and transparent, which is what we expect to do. And Catherine, any other sort of ideas that have begun to sort of pop up as ways to sort of uh, keep keep that fresh and keep people connected? Yeah. So um, as Sarah mentioned, a lot of people, a lot of care homes making good use and, and again within the community and home care, making good use of technology such as Skype or FaceTime. Um, actually, the old fashioned telephone is um, is still um, a big resource for many many people that are um, receiving care particularly those older people that might not have access to technology or might not find that so easy to use so telephones are still important a lot of group services have moved to online options so where people do have an online option or telephone option so for example Alzheimer's society run singing for the brain groups usually and we've started piloting those online and in fact we've got our first 
Facebook Live singing for the brain on my very last day at Alzheimer's Society. So I'll be singing my way out on uh, Thursday if anybody wants to log into there. But a lot of people have found that really, uh, really helpful to look at how we can replace services online and different people have done that. We've seen stories where some people have gone to visit the care home and talked to their relative through the window. And I've kind of got mixed feelings about that. And I think that's um, that's got to be a very individual and a very personal choice, because I think um, for some people, particularly those people that might have dementia and not understand the situation, that could be actually really quite confusing and quite distressing to not understand why somebody's outside the window and not coming in. So I think that's got to be a, a, an individual decision if that works for people to keep involved. And then again, going back to the old fashioned method, but people writing to care homes, writing postcards and letters. A lot of people love having a letter to read or having a staff member to sit and read the letter with them. And we've heard stories of schools who are um, obviously also in lockdown just now. So young people at home being given projects to write a letter to a local care home and sending that into the care home or draw pictures and things like that. And whilst that's not keeping people connected with their own families, it's again, making them feel more connected with the outside world and keeping people involved. And then I've seen, um, seen one care home that's kind of writing messages to the outside world and they've got the residents, I can't remember if that was yours, Sarah, or somewhere yeah. else actually, but was it yours? Yeah. They've got the message held up and they're showing that on Facebook and sending messages out to people. And again, the two-way process, having that conversation. So I think there's been an incredible amount of innovation, but if anybody else has got any great ideas, then, you know, write them down, let us know about them so we can spread them. Thank you, thank you both. And I think actually with that sort of general reflection I would have is this sort of period where social solidarity has come very much back to the fore, that sort of sense of community spirit. I think we have to hold on to that when we come out of this. And I think care homes, which possibly so often in the past would have been the place that people would walk by looking the other way, uh, increasingly, I think we now need to encourage that to be a change, that actually we see these as part of our community, not apart from our community. And I think that is one of the things I hope we'll see uh, come out of all of this. Now, um, one, of the, one of the questions that I've been asked is uh, from Sapport, and uh, they've asked, uh, are staff getting changed uh, when they come to work? In other words, this issue of are they wearing their uniform on the way to work or are they following uh, the sort of increasing ev evidence and ev sort of emphasis that the NHS is placing that staff travel to work in their own clothes and then change when they get there? I don't know, Sarah, what your arrangements are on that front. So, yeah, so our arrangements are that they, they travel in their own clothes and they change on they change when they get here. And that includes the, the shoe, the footwear as well. So we've got like a, a decontamination station, if you like, where the staff go in and um, do what they have to do. And then they, they go off and do their shift. And likewise, when they go home. So, yeah, we do ask staff to change. And we've done that quite early on in, in the pandemic. Thank you. One of, the, one of the other questions that's come through in a couple of ways uh, so far has been um, the, the, the challenge of working with uh, people who are living with dementia. Uh, and um, particularly in, in this time when, when they're being invited to socially distance, when there are some additional constraints on, on their ability and freedom to, to do what they want to do. Um, and the sort of two questions, one was, sort of from, it, uh, was from Isabel, she wanted to hear what sort of strategies you're using, I guess, to, to, to manage that and possibly mitigate the risks of, of it developing into more challenging behaviours. Um, and uh, Claire was then sort of asking, you know, how, how, what sort of thoughts do you have about how you practically are balancing the sort of risks between transmission and that wider sort of how you maintain, maintain people's sense of uh, well-being uh, going forward? So I'll, I'll come to Sarah first, then come to Catherine, I think, to sort of pick up some points on that? Uh, I mean, we have we have got a dementia unit. So, yeah, the, the, the social distancing, um, you know, trying to isolate people in their room is very difficult. Like, um, a lot of the homes out there. So we've got we've got no quick fix. Um, it, it's, you know, obviously we have a risk assessment that's put in place, but that doesn't stop the person from from moving around, you know, and, and you know, whatever they may do on their dementia on the dementia unit and it's hard there, there isn't an answer um it's the staff being proactive you know there's the, the de-escalation de techniques there's encourage other areas for people to go it's it's what you do anyway uh day to day but no there's no quick fix and it is it is a lot harder on on that unit um um you know to 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 manage that i mean on that unit we actually haven't got any symptomatic residents but we do on our other two units but that one is um it's a, a rule to itself at the moment so 
Um, but it, it, it's hard work and no, there isn't a, a quick answer for that. Thank you. Catherine? Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd second that. And I think this is part of the issue with the misconception of, um, of some of the government's advice on this. You know, it's extremely difficult to isolate people with dementia or any other um, cognitive impairment, um, that, you know, in that if they're not understanding or remembering the situation, it's very difficult to um, prevent them from doing something. And as a care home manager said to me just last week, they haven't relaxed the deprivation of liberty safeguards and nor should they, we're not recommending they do, but they can't lock people in the bedrooms. So if, you know, so, you know, one of the things that I've said to people when we've been having this conversation before is to a certain extent, we have to be realistic. That it's not very much to be gained by continuing to repeat a conversation with a person with advanced dementia that they're going to forget and they're going to get frustrated and they're going to get angry with. So the kind of techniques that the care home staff will have been hopefully trained to use or the home care staff trained to use over, over the years in any other circumstance about thinking about distraction, thinking about what, what the person is angry or upset about in the first place and trying to see if we can meet their need in a different way rather than continuing to remind people. But we have to remember that it's a basic human instinct social contact you know we are social creatures by our very nature and it's a basic human instinct to want social contact and when you denied that without having an understanding why that is going to cause a lot of frustration a lot of upset so you know trying to look at different ways one of the things that i've um, spoken about is even when you're doing just such basic tasks as helping somebody to get washed and dressed making a social activity about out of it you know singing a song together while you're doing it or having a chat or reminiscing while you're doing it so that people are, are not feeling so lonely and I think it's important to remember that you know with dementia you um you might forget the facts and figures you might forget the conversation that you've just had but the emotion stays with you so if you're feeling upset or angry you might not remember why you're feeling upset or angry but that stays with you whereas if you're supported to be given a sense of well-being a sense of happiness relief you might not remember why but it stays with you and again if there's a a good link to music some people find certain songs put them in a good mood or a bad mood you know you kind of think about that so there is some there is some guidance out there Alzheimer's Society have um, produced fact sheets and health sheets on that kind of thing but I think it is important to recognize as Sarah said that there isn't an easy answer to this one and this is I'm jumping to a question that you might have been coming to shortly this is why for, for me it's it's so wrong that people with COVID are being discharged back to care homes when the care homes can't isolate in the way that a hospital can or can't bury a nurse in the way that a hospital can and, and you know that is something that really needs to change I don't know if you want me to carry on on that and answer that question but <laughs> I mean I would just offer a reflection I mean as the NHS pressures begin to ease and we know that sort of currently hospitals are running at around 60 percent or uh, less occupancy there, there is there is capacity there is space um, and I think in a way that the, the sort of quid pro quo for the social care sector stepping in and, and really absorbing so much of this pressure over the last few months and helping to discharge so speedily to facilitate the clearing of beds so that we could respond as a nation to Covid now requires that to be reciprocated uh, with the NHS being able to pick up some of the pressures in the care home sector because if we don't do that and we do have a second wave, um, we will have a less resilient response the second time round. So it's, it's, it's an essential ingredient in, in managing the emergency, it seems to me. And uh, I think certainly it's something we have to be communicating uh, to our colleagues in government and to the uh, NHS locally as well. Um, there's, there's a, a, I've just had seen, a, seen a post that one of a bit of breaking news and whether it's breaking, I'm not absolutely certain, but um, back to your point, uh, Catherine, about um, the death toll in the community and in care homes and how, as I think in a way you said, we, we may never know the true number because of the way in which coroners uh, are sometimes requiring reporting of what, what the cause of death was. Um, but apparently uh, one third of all COVID deaths now are attributable to people who are living in care homes. So it, it is a significant proportion of the total and again, possibly un understates it. Um, I'm going to uh, come on to another question if I may, uh, which is um, uh, really about, yes, it's, it's again, it's sort of related to 
information about uh, people in domiciliary care on this occasion uh, and, and what, the, what we understand to be the position around the guidance at the moment in respect of uh, the wearing of masks. Um, and I think making the point about the logistical nightmare of making multiple visits uh, and uh, actually having sufficient stocks to be able to wear a, diff wear a different set of PPE for each visit. Um, I, I'm making it more as a comment, but I think it'd be interesting to get your, your reactions to that in, care, in the care home context, uh, just how much PPE you would be expecting to be using and, and, and so on. I'll come to Sarah, then come to Catherine, just to sort of respond on that. At PP levels, we're, we're going through a, a lot. There is, a, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to change that frequently. So obviously our usage has, has increased. Um, and like I say, following the guidance, there was some, um, are, you, are you ready to like the sessional use of the masks? But we got some clear guidance from our infection control team of when we should change that and how long we would use those masks for. But yeah, generally the, the usage has increased quite a lot uh, of how often and, you know, the frequency of them changing their, their PPE. Yeah, um, and I think there's been better guidance to care homes on, on uh, PP equipment than there has to home care. And I think the question asked if it was mandatory for um, to wear a mask. Um, and there, there isn't anything mandated on this. It's all kind of guidance and advisory. But um, if you think the mask is about yourself, it's, protect, it's protecting um, what you're breathing in and out. So it's not quite as important to change that between clients, but as soon as it starts to get damp, it becomes less effective. So it's important to change it reasonably regularly. Something like your gloves, they need changing between clients you know, quite clearly. So I think the guidance that's being given to care homes is equally applicable to home care, but less practical because you're moving between one home and another and, and it doesn't change the guidance about regular hand washing and you know and there quite simply isn't sufficient pp out there for, for home care staff either i think one of the things that i heard i think it might have been on the news this morning or last night was a, a home care provider saying that she had enough pp for all of her people today and she had enough for tomorrow but by the time wednesday comes she's run out so mm. this is a very much a just in time situation i think you've got to to do your best to to make it work for you as well as you can and like i say things like gloves actually absolutely shouldn't be using the same pair of gloves between two different people but you know masks you can probably go until you need a drink maybe until it starts to get wet but it depends how you're doing your treatment your visits and the distance between resident uh, um service users thank you I, just just on the issue of dnrs which you mentioned there's a there's a sort of question about um, whether the uh, uh, what's happened will change the guidance. I think you've already said, Catherine, and I just would underscore, there have been now a number of uh, very clear uh, letters uh, issued and uh, guidance issued in respect of uh, uh, people with learning disabilities uh, and uh, people uh, in later life, making it very clear that there should be no uh, blanket uh, use of uh, DNRs. Um, and, uh, I think we'll make sure if th those are not on the Sky website that we post those on the Sky website so those materials are available for people to use. There's also a question about uh, whether we know of any examples of where Dole's assessments have been done remotely. I don't know if, if either of you have any knowledge of whether people, uh, there have been any virtual sort of assessments done in that way at all. I've not had any, any no. We'll try and find out. Yeah, I'm assuming that the person means specifically in relation to coronavirus, um, and I, I'm not aware of any of that, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine it's, it's in a sense the change context that uh, uh, possibly uh, arises out of, out of COVID, but we'll, we'll, I think we'll just see what we can find out, and if we have any information, we will post that uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the website. Also, I think we will try and make sure we posted the links to the CQC uh, residents testing and the CQC staff testing. Um, mm. And I think there is also a comment here about uh, people that are living in supported living um, and what arrangements are being made for, for access to testing there as well. And I, I don't know that we know the answer to that and we will certainly query that with CQC as well. Um, right, um, last few minutes before we 
we begin to sort of uh, wind up the uh, the program. Um, just just really coming back to this point about discharge um, and whether we are at the moment sort of confident that um, the the guidance as I understand it now, which does say that you shouldn't be being discharged if you are COVID positive, um, is is being applied. And I just wonder what um, your 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 understanding of that was, Catherine, and, and what your experience of that was, Sarah. Um, yes, so they did change the guidance. I'm, I'm still aware of people being discharged with COVID both into the hospital and into the communities. Um, so I don't think that's being applied consistently uh, across the country. Um, but the the, DH, the Department of Health and Social Care guidance that came out, um, was it last week, talked about the setting up or the potential to set up what they call step down beds. And this could be in a care home, it could be in a community hospital, it could be in a hospital, but somewhere that's a sort of safe environment for people that are coronavirus positive to be cared for safely without them going back to um, the care home where the, the, unless the care home of course is a step down facility, um, where they might spread that. That isn't fully operational. I mean, the guidance has been put out, but that hasn't been operationalized. And that's something that we still need to see some action um, to make that happen. And I think that there are some very local decisions on that. What we're finding is that some hospitals are not even taking people in in the first place from mm. their home. So they're having the opposite problem and that they can't get the person admitted to hospital, whereas others are taking them in, testing them and discharging them straight back out. So there seems to be a very local localised decision there. And we do need to see this Department of Health guidance um, really pushed out and acted upon. But that needs action from the local um, health and social care um, commissioners to make sure that those step down beds are available. And, and Sarah, your, your experience of this? Yeah, it's pretty accurate that um, Catherine. Um, we've seen we have seen people going into hospital, and that that you know that that has happened. Um, we have, give you an example. We have had a resident that's been able to, that, that's actually come back to the home, um, and the scenario around there, she was um, positive with COVID. Um, the risk assessment was carried out, um, and it is a tricky one. But she could isolate in her own room. But her choice was to come home to die, and I think that's 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 the hard conversation to have when it's somebody's choice. Um, mm -hmm. of where they want to, to end their life. So um, in that situation, we ensured that the risk assessments were followed and she did get her choice and, and died peacefully at, at the home. Um, so I think it is a difficult one, but yeah, the guidance I think needs to be a bit more structured around, around the, that. Thank you very much. Um, and just as we sort of come to, come to the end, it'd be, I think it's always, it's always difficult to start turning um, your mind to, to what the future looks like when you're in the middle of a, a crisis. Um, I thought, Sarah, what your comments about um, ways of working, already changing, working smarter is, 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 a, is a positive sign that you are doing that. You are beginning to think about what comes next. Um, clearly, we still have uh, many months around um, the uh, shielded populations in the community needing to be supported uh, in different ways. And clearly, we're going to continue to see um, additional steps to keep people safe uh, in all sorts of care settings. But I wonder, you know, looking forward, what you hope will come out of this positively uh, for social care? What would be the things you would hope um, that the government will be taking away from this and that uh, perhaps uh, your neighbours and our fellow citizens might take away from this in terms of social care. So I'm just giving you a sort of bit of space to to sort of set out your your hopes for the future. I guess I'm going to start with Sarah, then come to Catherine, and then I see where we are on time. Um, I think for for us on the social care side, the care will be recognised of the important job that we do. Um, I think for going for the future of, of anything now, with anything we do, we should all ref reflect on what went well and what didn't go well, um, and some clear guidance. Quite clearly, we. We're sort of managing okay now with, with faced with a, a pandemic, but we don't know what's around the corner. And I think it is important to to make sure that you know everything that we've we've done so far at government level beyond me um, is reflected on what went well, <laughs> you know, and and our barriers are removed. And more so, I think is is li people listening to us that's on the front line. 
So, you know, a lot of focus for the NHS and a lot of respect to them. But again, listening to, to everybody that's key workers, essential workers of what it's been like and, and their learning experiences, because mine speaking today is going to be different to, to some of the, the people listening in. So I think it's important to capture everybody's feedback and, and, and you know, their suggestions, because as a team, we probably have the, have the answers together. But, yeah. Well, thank you. I think there's lots to be done on the learning, the lessons front, I'm sure. Um, Catherine. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'd echo what Sarah said, really, because I think, you know, as I said earlier on, social care has been the, the poor relation, the forgotten cousin, whatever, um, for a long time in a, a lot of people's minds. And the example that I always use is that everybody knows why the police, the education, the NHS is useful, because everybody, even why, you know, the council to empty bins, everybody has use of different um, public services in one way or another. But people only need social care when they know about it, which means that it's not in the hearts and minds of a lot of people and a lot of the electorate. And I think that this um, crisis, this pandemic, has brought social care to the forefront of people's minds in a way that has never happened before. And we really need to capitalise on that and we really need to keep it in people's minds and recognise that, you know, if I just stick to dementia as an example, and people that use in social care are, are far wider than people just with dementia, but you know, one in three people is affected by dementia. That means that you might not be using social care now, but you are very likely to be using social care in one way or another at some point in the future. And we really need to take this opportunity to get parity of funding and get recognition and, and drive that political will to make sure that social care isn't the poor relation going forward. Um, and I think the other thing that I'd pick up again that Sarah mentioned is the ways of working that we've all learned to do over this last few weeks. We found out that most jobs can be done remotely that we didn't think we could. We've had some very, very difficult conversations remotely. Assessments have been done remotely. Um, and I think actually we can reach far more people for less money remotely. And so we should take the opportunity for that to drive our reach. But at the same time, what this period has shown us is where face to face is important and where that is missing. And I think we should use this opportunity to really drive how we work going forward to expand our reach as far as we can digitally, while saving that really crucial, precious face to face resource for where it's really needed. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think that is a very important part of what needs to come out of this. Um, as I say, I've been incredibly struck by this sort of renewing of uh, a spirit of social solidarity in this country. Um, you know, we may well be all facing the same storm at the moment, but we're not all in the same boat. Uh, and we need to think about how uh, our social care and our other public services are strong and able to, uh, to meet that challenge as we come out of COVID. Um, I think for Sky, um, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, what we really have to do now, and I'm really pleased that Catherine is joining us to help us do this, is act as a uh, point of uh, uh, pressure, a point of gathering really for uh, the ideas of what social care uh, needs to look like uh, in the 21st century, what we need to do to uh, make sure that it doesn't go back into the shadows, that it is very much there in the front line and really being recognised. I think one of the things I've also seen, I think many of us have seen uh, in, in the way in which social care is being reported now, uh, and indeed other key worker roles, is that sort of redistribution of esteem that's taking place in our society, a much greater value, which ultimately needs to be reflected in pounds and pence, uh, or that we are now attaching to key workers, uh, I think it has to be part of uh, the future social contract we have in this country um, and as someone who's been involved in trying to get reform in social care for the last 30 years and only too well understands how fragile and vulnerable we had allowed the sector to become uh, one can only be humbled by the work and leadership of people like Sarah and the staff that she leads that you are tirelessly turning up and dealing with whatever's thrown at you and some of it's pretty nasty uh, during this difficult time. So I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you for that. Thank you to all the people who've been on this uh, webinar today for your questions. I'm sure we've not answered all of them. We will try and make sure that as much information is on our website. Please do check out the Sky website. The information's there on your screens. But let me just end by saying thank you very much to Sarah uh, for joining us on this webinar. 
Thank you very much for Catherine. We're very much looking forward to you joining us here at Sky uh, and taking us on to the next stages uh, of making the case for a great quality social care in this country. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.